it's when I read the scriptures, I see them as a mandate. Uh, I see them as not giving me information, clear information. Uh, I, I put myself into the position of these people who, who produced these scriptures, but also say, what would they want now? To the Harbour Grace excursion with the boys to have. Books really saved my life. Lovely to be back in Toronto. Thanks for being here. I thought it might be um, appropriate to begin with just a simple question about the title of your book. Mm. Um, the book is called The Lost Art of Scripture, Rescuing the Sacred Text. What do you mean by the art of scripture? Well, uh, when you uh, read uh, a particular book, it's very important to know the genre uh, uh, this that you're dealing with. When you're reading Pride and Prejudice, you're not distressed to learn that Mr. Darcy or Mr. Bingley never existed. Um, and because <laughs> you're, even though this may not be factual, or, uh, you are learning something very important about the human condition. Um, and similarly, uh, the, the scripture in all traditions has a particular genre, that, and we, we no longer read it according to that genre. First of all, it was a performative art. Scripture was always sung or recited or chanted uh, or is set to plain song or to music or polyphony. Um, and until the late 18th century, most people couldn't read. And so reading scripture today is a bit like reading the, the libretto of an opera. A, a whole half of a lot of it is missing. And scripture was always accompanied by ritual, which involved a lot of uh, physical movement. And neurophysicists tell us we learn a lot from the way we move and behave and our gestures, and all that is missing too. Uh, so that we read it too factually at the moment. Um, and uh, it, it also, uh, we look back on it. Uh, we, we, we've got a habit now of going back since Luther, who wanted to go back to the early church. Uh, script, uh, and people are now re doing this in a really ridiculous way. I mean, so you've got uh, fundamentalists in the United States who are trying to revive the old Israelite uh, legislation and stoning, uh, stoning disobedient children, for example. Mm -hmm. Um, and in Saudi Arabia, people are trying to live in the, according to the mores of the seventh century. But we are not living in the seventh century. And scripture was always an innovative art. You were supposed to apply it to your current situation and change the meaning. Uh, but we don't do that anymore. You call it an art, but was it seen as an art back then? Well, no one would have said, we are now having a, a, this is an art form. Uh, but but there, were, there, were, there is a, a current, whether you're talking about Chinese or Indian scriptures, um, that there, there is that current, uh, the, the fact that it's innovative um, and that, it's all, that it was always sung. In fact, in India, the sound was always more important than the sense, which is something difficult for us to understand. Yeah. And we'll talk about that as well. Mm. Tell me about the moment when you realized, when you actually felt that the art was, was lost. Oh, well, just listening uh, to uh, people talking about scripture. Uh, I, when you start off writing a book, uh, you have one idea. Uh, then along the way, you suddenly start seeing all kinds of different things. Um, so uh, I started off with the idea of, of scripture being a, a performative art and that it was sung and chanted and recited. But then I started finding all kinds of other things too al al along the way. Um, and, and that uh, made, started to make sense as you started to see uh, how uh, our attitudes have changed and how it's really incomprehensible to us. Unless we, if we could recover it, we can recover it. Uh, and, and one of the things scripture should be doing is pushing us into action. All the scriptures insist that it's not just a question of me and my God and my salvation. Uh, you've got work to do in the world. What kind of action? Uh, two kinds. 
uh, in the monotheisms, the, uh, the, the, the Judaism, Christianity, and Islam, the emphasis has always very much been about equity and justice. The prophets of Israel had no time for people who said their prayers nicely in the temple, but neglected the plight of the poor and let their rulers get away with uh, war crimes. Um, and Jesus was a, very much a social activist. Uh, and you couldn't get into the kingdom of God unless you were ready to feed the hungry and visit the sick naked and, and in prison. And the Quran is nothing but a cry for a just and decent society where poor and vulnerable people are treated with respect. Uh, in the, in it, that, this, uh, this is also very important in China and India, but in those countries too, you have a, a, a very important environmental uh, emphasis. Right from the beginning, uh, about 1500, the Vedas are very concerned about the fragility of the cosmos, and they start uh, creating rituals to try to help uh, support the cosmos. Now, obviously, these had no scientific valency, but what they did was create an attitude. And instead of seeing uh, the environment or nature simply as a resource, uh, it was something to which you had to give something back and, and to be aware that it needed cultivating. Um, so, uh, so, so those are the those are the two main. Uh, th it, it must. It's not enough to read your Bible or have it read to you in church and then go home to lunch and forget about it. Uh, you've got. Uh, you have a mission to the world. At the end of the Catholic Mass, the priest used to say, "Ite missa est." Uh, go, you are sent forth. And that, as I say, didn't mean just going home and, and having a, a pleasant time or just polishing your own spirituality. Uh, you had to go out into to society. As, as the Buddha said, uh, you must return to the marketplace after yes. you've encountered enlightenment and back to the mess of human affairs and there practice compassion for all living beings. Now, the overarching message of this book is that you want those scriptures to be rescued. Mm. But I have to say that in listening to you now and in reading the book, sometimes I got the sense that you were also almost calling for, you know, make religion great again. Uh. <laughs> Do you, is, is that fair? Is that a fair characterization? Well, I, I couldn't, I don't think I could have that attitude living in London. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, where I mean, my, in, in London, my best friends don't read my books, let alone uh, uh, so to do, and, uh, I, you know they would be amazed to see this um, and uh, keep on asking me why I write this dreadful stuff. So, um, so no, I, I don't. I, I have very few hopes in that direction. Uh, but um, on the other hand, when I go and visit other countries, I mean here, but also the United States and also uh, Muslim countries. Mm -hmm. Uh, in particular, um, I find uh, uh, there's a great sense of urgency. Um, uh, people want to, to they want uh, an active religion rather than some, and they're worried about the state of religion in their countries mm -hmm. here and now. It, now that desire is parallel to a desire that existed, you know, for millennia, and mm -hmm. among all kinds of different people, as you point out in your book. Um, you know, it's a, a desire to sort of reach beyond what's sensed or reasoned or that we can see with our eyes and hear our, with our ears. Um, you start your book by describing a prehistoric artifact called the Lion Man. Can yes. I get you to describe that here now? Ah, uh, it's a, a, a little figurine about 31 centimeters high uh, that's 40,000 years old. Uh, it was discovered in uh, a cave in southern Germany just two or three days before the outbreak of World War II. Uh, and we had it in the British Museum uh, on loan for a while. Um, and it, 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 it is, you feel extraordinary reverence when you see this. And the Lion Man has a lion's head and a partly human body. And it shows that something has happened to the uh, human mind uh, because it can imagine something that doesn't exist. Uh, and, uh, and this is the essence of religion. Now, I, I opened that, the exhibition where we had this, and I uh, said this, and I could feel the audience going, <gasps> you know, you're saying that God does not exist. That is exactly what I'm saying. Um, and so, uh, it, so did Tom Thomas Aquinas. 
uh, for, uh, who said, God is not one of the things that exist. God is not a being. God is esse se ipsum. God is being itself. Um, and, and unimaginable to us. Um, and so, uh, and, and, and he's, so here you have a fusion of an animal who, the, the cave lion, was one of the, big, the biggest predator in the region. And here you have him fused with the, uh, with the human, his human prey, I suppose. And he's obviously been uh, ha handed around the community and stroked. He's, he's, he's very worn, as though they, they, they are some kind of ritual took place in that cave uh, where they found it, because it, it, it's not been inhabited. Uh, it, and he was found uh, being put in a, in, in a little niche, carefully away. But what we're seeing is something that does not that takes us out of the real world, but is 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 fusing a, da a danger, and and uh, embracing a danger, um, and making it uh, seeing it's it's instead of seeing them simply as an enemy, embracing the enemy as it were. So you you and, and this comes I I. I I don't know whether we're going to get on to this. Uh, it shows that it, this is a right hemispheric. Uh, fr it, it's, it's activated by the right hemisphere of the brain, which uh, is the part where which sees the connection between things. Uh, at, just as you see with the cave lion okay. here, w information reaches us through the. Uh, we don't see the world as it really is. Our brains filter things through to us. We, see, we receive the information first in the right hemisphere where we see the unity and interconnection of things as, as you do with Lion Man there. Then it passes to the left hemisphere, the more analytical side of us, where we say, what is this? What, how, how is this going to affect us? Then it should move back so that you have a balance. Yeah. Now we in our culture, certainly in London, we are very left hemispheric. Um, and uh, and, 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 you know, we're encouraging our children to uh, focus on the sciences uh, rather than the arts. But the, the uh, so the right hemisphere is the source of artworks like Lion Man that sees the interconnection between things. Uh, but it also, it's also the seat of uh, compassion because we also see, and justice, because we can also see our connection with one another and with far away, so we need both hemispheres to work together in tandem. And we will get into that a little yes. bit more as well. I, I wanted, though you raise it, and one of the symptoms, for lack of a better word, of, of, of that kind of uh, practice being done on the right, right side of the brain is that, as you mentioned, most scripture was actually oral at the beginning. Yes. I just wonder what does that orality tell you about the scripture itself? Um, well, A, you have, you have to listen. Um, and, and as I, I've said, it accompanied with ritual, uh, but um, also the music. Um, the mus music is something that uh, is very right hemispheric. In fact, music is the, it's the seat, of, uh, it's seated in the right hemisphere. And it fills, it, 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 it works through the body. As soon as you hear music, you may want to sway with it or, uh, or, or to tap, our foot, tap a foot or something. Uh, you want to move with it. But it also evokes sorrow and sadness. It goes to the heart of, uh, of deep buried things in us uh, that we can't really put into words. Um, and so that having that, that oral uh, uh, oral and oral uh, side shows that it, it, it's deeply emotive. Uh, tears come to one's eyes when you're listening to certain kinds of music. And certainly that's certainly true with the Quran, for example, which uh, the word Quran means recitation. And, uh, it, and it, that, uh, the Quran reciting really is an art form. People will g travel miles to hear a, a good uh, Quran reciter, just as we'd go to hear a, a a famous soprano. You say Arabic is well suited to that sort of uh, endeavor. And it's certainly yeah. in, in the prophet's time, they were not literate. The prophet couldn't read or write, um, and th but they, they had an extraordinary ear for poetry yeah. at that time. 
um, and so that, that they would have been very attuned to the layers of meaning uh, in, in the Quran as well as it, its whole musical valency. So the oral was important, the spoken was important. So I wonder, you point out in the book that, that Moses, I didn't know this, that leader of his people who was a receiver of, of God's law actually had a, st a stammer. Yes, and I think that's very important. Why? Uh, because he tells, at one point, he, he's saying to God, look, why have you chosen me as a prophet? I've got a terrible speech impediment. I can't speak. No one can understand a word I say. And uh, God says to him, don't worry, your brother Aaron is a good speaker. He can convey this uh, to the people for you. And um, so we're get what we're getting is God's words at least secondhand. And you wonder how much Aaron really understood of what was going on. <laughs> um, and, uh, and so, um, but the point is that Aaron is also nice, voluble, clear, clear speaking Aaron, is also guilty of the archetypal idolatry. He, he is the one who gets the Israelites to worship God in the form of a golden calf, which is seen as the archetype. So it, that you have here a sense that clarity is not that, that God is speaking through, removes, God is not something easily assimilated. Now, this is, um, this is not the way we think about God today. We talk about God very loosely. God wants this, lo loves that, hates that. Uh, we don't know what God is. We are hearing, as I say, his words through a, a second hand at best. Um, and, he, and, and too much clarity, too much putting God into a particular form, uh, is idolatry because and if you look at the book of Genesis for example you start off in Genesis uh, in chapter 1 with a, a picture of everything that a God should be uh, there he is in total control totally powerful just has to speak a word and everything comes into being totally fair blesses all that he has made he's no favorites he sees that it, they're all good um, but then uh, Three, set, three chapters in, this God who is in total control has completely lost control of his creation. And the rest of the book of Genesis systematically deconstructs that nice, clear picture of God. The benign creator becomes a cruel destroyer in the time of the flood, uh, wiping out nearly the whole of the human race in a, in a fit of what can only be called peak, um, and, um, and then shoves a rainbow in the sky afterwards as a kind of consolation prize. <laughs> um, and the God who uh, was so fair and blessing everybody, it shows monstrous favoritism. Right from the start with uh, Cain, he refuses his sacrifice for no reason and uh, puts an iron in, Ca in Cain's soul and you have the first murder. Um, and finally... Uh, and Jacob, Esau, you know, uh, the, the, you hear the, the, the sorrow of, uh, of uh, Esau, the rejected one. Have you no blessing for me, father? He says to, to Isaac, father, bless me too. And nothing can be done. Hagar, who's dumped in the wilderness uh, by Abraham with the, her baby son at God's command. And this is the world we live in where... Uh, things are not in the control of a nice benign God, where, uh, at, where terrible disasters happen, we see it on the news, uh, where w w we see the total unfairness of life, which life is not fair. And at the end, the God who was continually intervening in human affairs at every opportunity at the beginning of Genesis just fades out. And Joseph and his brothers have to wrestle with their dreams and insights, and, and, and just as we do. So what that, and, and in all the scriptures, they are saying, do not think you have a nice, clear image of God. When I was uh, eight years old, I had to learn this uh, catechism answer. Uh, what is God, they asked, and, and, and quick as a flash, in a single sentence, we had to chant, God is the supreme spirit who alone exists of himself, and is infinite in all perfections. Wrong. Uh, God, 
A, the whole idea that you can simply sum up the God in a single sentence is, is, is a disaster. But God is not a being. He's not a spirit, not even the supreme spirit. Like what Thomas Aquinas said. Um, and um, so, so, so uh, but the point of that, that catechism, the catechism, and many of you may have that, had, had this too, they were compiled after the Reformation by both the Catholic uh, clergy, the Catholic leaders, and Protestant leaders to prevent people from reading scripture. The, 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 uh, the uh, reformers, the Protestant reformers, as you know, thought it would be easy, as, as, as Zwingli said, scripture explains itself. It's clear. <laughs> Uh, Luther said that a simple man with his Bible and knows as much as any uh, council of bishops. Assuming that it's the word of God. Yes, but, you, but the, the word of God, as we've seen with the Moses uh, Aaron debat, is, is not clear. Mm. And, the, and the, the reformers soon found that because they couldn't agree on basic issues. Uh, and they were at loggerheads from the very beginning. They couldn't worship together because they couldn't work out what God meant by what Jesus meant by Eucharist. Um, and th this this kind of thing happens. And so they unless so they made a ruling that unless you could read Scripture in the original languages in Greek and Hebrew, you mustn't read Scripture. You must read it through these filters of catechism that gave you clear doctrinal answers that have no valency in Scripture uh, and take out the mystery of God and reduce God to a set of untenable doctrines. I'm interested in the, in the times even before that when people were encouraged uh, and did did not think literally that they believed their own scriptures, that they, that they are, you know, the words of God, that they were thought on the right-hand right -hand side of the brain. You write that, bef that before the early pre-modern period, for example, scripture was open-ended, that it was fluid, it was adaptable, it was changeable. Can you tell me how? Yes, uh, yes, indeed. The, the best way to introduce is, is through rabbinic midrash. Um, after the loss of the temple, uh, which was destroyed by the Romans in the year 70. The temple had been the, the pivot of Jewish religious life. Without it, Jews could not read the, the old scriptures in the same way. Um, but they didn't just dump the scripture. They developed a midrash, and the, it, that comes from a Hebrew root, darash, which means to go in search of something. I, that is, to look for something that is not self-evident. And they de devised a, a, a method whereby they'd take, uh, someone would ask them a question, say, about God, and they'd take an answer from, say, one sentence from the book of Psalms, another from one of the prophets, and a third from, say, from the book of Genesis. Bung the three verses together, and then you had something different. The person who, uh, who, who created this form of exegesis was Rabbi Akiva, who's killed by the Romans in the early second century. And there's a story about him that, uh, or there's a story that Mos his, the fame of his extraordinary scripture classes uh, reached heaven. And Moses got to hear about it. And he was intrigued. So he thought he'd come down to earth and join in the class. So he, he right, came down and sat in the back row, in the eighth row behind the other students, but found to his intense embarrassment that he had, didn't understand a word of the Torah that Rabbi Akiva uh, was uh, expounding, the Torah that had been revealed to him on Mount Sinai. And he went back to heaven, though, say, shaking his head like a proud father, saying, my sons have defeated me. They've gone beyond me. And the, another uh, uh, rabbi pointed out that that which was revealed to Moses and his contemporaries uh, was uh, changed by Rabbi Akiva, that you, you, the, the scripture goes on. And they said, scripture, revelation did not happen once and for all time. It, hap it occurred every time a Jew confronted the sacred text. And in the early Talmud uh, versions, there would be a blank page. And every student had to imagine himself standing on Mount Sinai beside Moses with his teacher and 
getting, bringing something new and adding it to, that, to the revelation on that blank page. And, uh, they, and, and without, if they didn't do that, then the revelation would not be complete. So that innovative forward thrusting movement, making it new, making it speak to, an to a present that bore no relation to the past. And the New Testament, the first, uh, they're written by Jews, who have also got this idea. They're, but these, uh, the evangelists, Mark, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, as we call them, they are uh, really closer to the uh, kind of exegesis used by the Qumran community, by the Dead Sea, where, who saw in all the texts of the past a, a prediction of their own movement. And you've got that wonderful story of uh, the disciples on the road to Emmaus, and uh, Jesus has just been crucified, and they, uh, they're in terrible distress, and a stranger comes in. He says, look, I can see that you're really distressed. Is there anything I can do to help? I'm always quite grateful that uh, those disciples weren't Brits. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, the stiff upper lip who would have said cheerily oh no thanks we're fine and that would have been <laughs> the end, that would have been the end of the matter but no they they take they take him into their confidence they bear their grief and he could have just laughed them to scorn but no and then uh, we're told that he uh, goes through the scriptures starting with Moses and shows how it all pointed to Jesus and the crucifixion what not a, nothing is like that, in, but this is new, inventive midrash, uh, the, the Christian midrash. And then, of course, the story ends. They, they have dinner together, and when, Jesus, when the stranger breaks the bread, they recognize that it's Jesus, and he disappears. Mm -hmm. But they say, this is important, did not our hearts burn within us when he expounded the scriptures to it? This isn't just a clever dick cerebral thing. It's uh, with, that's with Midrash, it's an entirely emotive. Uh, and it was, the, we're taught Luke was written, that the Gospel of Luke was written in the early second century. Uh, so by this time, that would have been how they experienced Midrash in, in community, where they would get uh, an insight into, um, it, I hope I haven't offended him in some way. <laughs> 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 So uh, they would get an insight um, from their reading, from their reading, but something that was emotional, uh, that was, it wasn't just a, a bit of clever, clever uh, m manipulation of the text. One of the arguments you make repeatedly is that scripture shouldn't be read literally. Mm -hmm. So if it isn't literally true, what makes scripture scripture? Well, it's certainly not telling us facts uh, about the creation of the world, for example. Um, there are numerous in the Bible uh, accounts of how God created the world, um, and uh, nobody knows. These are, and when, so, and, and similarly, uh, you, unless they are speaking to you now, unless they're speaking to you now, you, you can forget it. Ibn Arabi said, for example, that when you, every time you recite the Quran, it should mean something different to you. And if it doesn't mean something different to you, you're not reciting it correctly because that's what's needed at this moment. You must apply it to your situation, but it must be practical. But what makes it scripture, is it something that's innate or is it, is it a function of social customs or is it? It's, it's a, an art form that people help people to deal with transcendence. Transcendence is a fact of life. Uh, our, our brains are wired for it. We, 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 we encounter uh, 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 said that, that the world is something that points to the human, the human brain goes in, we, we seek it out mm -hmm. and we look for moments when we listen to music or, or read a poem, when we get that sense of being touched deeply within and lifted momentarily beyond ourselves and feel that we inhabit our humanity a bit more fully than usual. Um, and you can get it, people get it in sport, which is a kind of religion. Um, but th th this, uh, not all scriptures do this. Uh, for example, um, they, they, there are, uh, th or not all religions really want scripture. Uh, Guru Nanak, for example, had no interest in scripture, but later Sikhs did develop a, a scriptural canon. Um, and Zen Buddhists, they, they don't depend upon scripture. So it's, it's not de rigueur. 
but what was your question exactly? Well, just way, <laughs> I mean, in a way, you, 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 you give me a better question, which is how is it different than a poem and, and, and in the way that it, as you say, it, it touches you in a, in a specific you. way, but how do you distinguish between a scripture and a it poem po that does exactly Because the same it thing? points you to practical action. Um, practical action, it's no, as I said earlier, it's no good just having a nice little warm glow in church and then going home to lunch. Um, you've, uh, the, you must, the, the prophets of Israel, for example, had no time for people who said their prayers nicely and neglected the plight of the poor and the oppressed. Um, and so you must go out and work. The, the, the Buddha, for example, is the very good story of told in, in the Buddhist scriptures about him that after he'd achieved enlightenment, he had the inconvenient thought that perhaps he should help other people to do this too. <laughs> and, and then he thought, no, I don't want to do that. Um, he said, this, this demands, uh, it's very demanding, and uh, people are going to have to give up their ego, their sense of uh, self, w and, and th they don't want to do that, and it's just going to be too depressing, I'm not going to do it. At which point, Brahma, the god in the highest heaven, uttered a terrible cry. And then he said, the world then is lost. The world will be utterly lost. And he descended from heaven and knelt, the god kneels before the enlightened man. And he said, Lord, please preach. He said, because look at the world. And it, the, 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 we are told that the Buddha looked at the world with the eye of compassion and spent the next 40 years of his life tramping through the villages and towns of India, helping people to deal with their pain. Um, and so, script, whereas a poem, you can read it and you can be moved, it does not ask you to give up a nice, comfortable life, to immerse yourself in the sorrow of the world, uh, to worry about. We're, we're, uh, we're, we're very much, you probably don't do it in Canada, but, um, uh, when um, in, in, in the UK, when we're watching the news, um, it's quite common for the newscaster to say, if there's a bit of disturbing footage coming up, you may find this upsetting or disturbing. And but that gives you a chance to go out and make a cup of tea or <laughs> switch channels, yeah. anything, so that you don't have to be invaded by the yeah. horrors that of our world. That does happen here too. Yes, yes okay. Yeah. So, um, at, at th but this is a very bad sign. It didn't always happen. Um, and we, we, we must allow the pain of the world to disturb us. Our scriptures demand that. It's n they're not just about creating a nice, and so a lot of spirituality today is very self-centered, mm -hmm. it seems to me. I mean, yoga, for example, um, <laughs> Uh, it's fine, I mean, uh, but it's not, it was not designed as an aerobic exercise. Uh, it was meant for, uh, it was meant uh, to extirpate the ego at a very profound level. Same with mindfulness. The Buddha devised mindfulness and gave it to his monks, not so that they could feel more themselves and more in charge of themselves. Uh, there's nothing wrong with it, but it's just not what, uh, it's not what the Buddha had in mind. Uh, because you discovered that you, the self did not exist at all. That the self was a, an entire fiction, and you could lay it to one side. And yet one term that you sprinkle throughout the book is the ancient word ecstasis. Mm -hmm. I think I'm saying that correctly. Mm -hmm. From which we, of course, get the word ecstasy. Yes. What is, what is that term referring to? Ecstasis means stepping outside the self. Ecstasis, standing outside the self. And that's what we mean by transcendence, when we feel that we are lifted momentarily beyond ourselves. But it also means we leave that grasping, nasty self behind that says me first, or that blocks off the pain of the world and doesn't allow it to disturb us. Um, and that we go out uh, uh, and put our, ourselves to one side. That is the essence of and a lot of religion. I, I was brought up the whole the way the whole purpose of religion was getting into heaven. Um, everything was about salvation, my personal salvation. You mean it's not? No, <laughs> oh, I hope not. Uh, because um, it, that, uh, it, that simply embeds you in the ego that you're supposed to transcend. You're supposed to go out, put yourself at the service 
of others to heal the pain of the world, as, as you see all the great prophets and sages did. Now, in the book, The Lost Art of, of Scripture, you say that experiencing Scripture is or should be transformative, as you just mm. said, but it's not simply a moral transformation, as in following a set of rules, and it's not just a state of mind or a sensation. So what shape does transformation take for you personally? Ah, well, for years, I wanted nothing whatever to do with religion ever again. Um, and uh, for me, the ecstasy comes from study. I, and c basically coming to speak for, at occasions like this. I may see it seem quite voluble, but I'm a private little soul. Um, <laughs> I live alone um, uh, and love it. I've never got married. Uh, don't regret it. Um, and I love my silence and my study, and being out on the road for weeks and, and going around the world talking is, n is, is, is a real struggle. Uh, but, I, but I must do it, uh, because the, the, thing, the world is such a mess. Um, now, but the study is, is, is it, I, as I say, I went right away, and my, the, my first books were really anti-religious. They, they, they were smart and clever and superficial. Uh, but uh, I, and one career after another faded, uh, failed, in, usually in ignominy and shame. Uh, and my, when my television collapsed, f f career collapsed, I was, went off and I started writing History of God. And I expected it to follow the skeptical line of its predecessors, showing that when circumstances changed, uh, people rejigged the idea of God to suit themselves. But then, f first of all, I was now in silence and working alone. And there was no one to egg me on to be outrageous and, and bold. And I began to realize that theology is poetry, and you can't read poetry in a noisy nightclub. You need, uh, you need quiet. And then I encountered this footnote in uh, a big, hefty, uh, three-volume work on Islam. And the footnote said that the, told me that the historian of religion must, uh, must adopt what the, the, the writer called the science of compassion. That is a form of knowledge that comes through compassion, which means to feel with the other. He said, the historian of religion cannot uh, judge the spiritualities of the past from the vantage point of post-enlightenment rationalism. She or he must, uh, in a scholarly manner, recreate everything that was going on at the time the spirituality was produced, either you know, intellectually or um, uh, just finding out what was happening in environmentally, politically, economically. And, and till you until you finally got the whole uh, setting in which this spirituality developed, and do not leave it, he said, until you can feel yourself feeling the same. Were well, I there, I would do it, feel like that. In this way, he said, you broaden your horizons and make a place for the other in your mind and heart. And I think that's what changed me around, uh, because that you have to leave that clever over-educated Karen to one side and enter into the feeling of the other. And that's, uh, that, cha that changed me, I think. So for, for me, uh, it's when I read the scriptures, I see them as a mandate. Uh, I see them as not giving me information, clear information. Uh, I, I put myself into the position of these people who, who produced these scriptures, but also say, what would they want now? Uh, so there is that, so it, it, it is that calm pathane, to feel with the other. And scripture should make us do that. Um, you, 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 they all tell us, A, to look at the fragility of, of, of the natural world, as the, the Indian and the Chinese do. And the, 
the Chinese have been a great revelation to me, the Confucians. And they see uh, that ethos of compassion as radiating out. And I think this is important for our time now. Uh, you start uh, learning about the school of compassion is in the family. You can't go out and save the world if your own family is in disarray. And it's very elaborately orchestrated so that everybody in the Chinese family gets a measure of absolute respect in an ideal way. And it trains you in feeling for the other. But it can't stop in the family. You then spread out to the next circle, which is the city in which you live. And you've got to involve yourself in that city life. Uh, and I'm, for example, I'm incensed by the fact in London that 25% of the population in this rich city are living in poverty. And record numbers of homeless people are speaking in the street, uh, sleeping in the street. Worry about, you should, this should worry, you know, instead of just part, you know, stepping over these bodies. Um, and so that, and, and try to do something about it, but it can't stop with your city. It then has to go out to the whole country and finally, the Chinese said to the whole world. And I think that, whole, that, that ethos of reaching out to the whole world is essential at the moment when we are s retreating into nationalistic ghettos, like Brexit, for example. Yeah. Um, uh, and, uh, and, 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 here, and in Mexi the Mexico border, for example, when the Berlin Wall came down, people were dancing in the street. Uh, but we saw people cheering at the prospect in the United States of a wall between uh, Mexico and the United States. I mean, this, this was just, it's, uh, the, uh, we're, we're looking at the way the migrants are dying, literally dying every day to try to get into the UK. We've just had this hi hideous incident of 20, uh, four, 29 people being yes. suffocated in, in a refrigerated van from Vietnam, and yet all we're thinking of doing is keeping them out. We can't live like that in our world now, because we've, those concentric circles, because of our communication with one another, electronic communication, uh, e economic in interdependence, we, when stock markets fall in one part of the world, they stumble all around that day. Uh, we, this is a this retreat into narrow ethnic nationalism is a denial of what our times are supposed to be. So I all I got all that from, from Confucius, that we have all of us a responsibility to reach out to the four corners of the world. I'm just curious on this very point. Did you read scripture differently when you were a nun? Did you see this global picture when you were reading back then? No, not at all. You see, we were Catholics. We didn't really read scripture very much. <laughs> uh, uh, we, <laughs> um, and, uh, <laughs> but we, we chanted it, uh, and uh, there came, uh, uh, there was a moment, I, I was telling you, my guests the, the, the other night, last night, uh, I, I entered in 1960, the 1960s uh, during the, the Vatican Council, and we'd, we chanted the Divine Office every day, which we went, went through the whole Psalter, the whole Psalms, every, uh, every week, chanting them uh, in Latin. Then the dictate came through that we had to do it in English, and a lot of the sisters were thrilled about this because a lot of them didn't read Latin. I, I, I could manage it. Um, and they said it would be lovely to be able to pray it properly because we'd be able to identify and understand what's, what the words are. But not all the Psalms are very edifying. <laughs> um, you know, the Lord is my shepherd is lovely, but there are a number of Psalms which are blood-curdling in their wrath, uh, where the psalmist imagines in great detail what he'd like to do to his enemies or what he'd like God to do. So if you can imagine a large room, a large chapter about this size, filled with British n nuns, very restrained, polite, uh, some of them born in the Edwardian era, chanting politely, Oh God, smash their teeth in their mouths. <laughs> uh, and uh, well, we just did that. We, we just 
collapsed in mirth. I could not go on. Uh, with the sheer incongruity of it. So, uh, and the, but the only way we could get over that was going back to the old way of chanting it and not taking any notice of the sense. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and yet I can see now, I, ca- I don't think I understood it then, that that was a way of getting rid of the self in a way. Mm. Uh, it, it, it's what the uh, you, 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 so you're not seeing applying all these words to me or mine. Uh, the Psalms represent the whole of humanity. We are a violent species. We want to smash people's teeth in. Well, just just on that point, you acknowledge <laughs> ju- you, you acknowledge that every scripture tradition has in it passages that advocate violence. Yes. You, d- you do come across that uh, more than once. Yet you also say that every religious tradition advocates for the other. You talk about the compassion, mm-hmm. uh, that, that that message is at the heart of every single mm. scripture. I find that circle kind of hard to square. Yeah, but of course, it, 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 look. Can you do it? Are yes. You able to do it? Basically, the scriptures are not from God. There are scriptures. We write them. Uh, but we may be inspired, or, but, but we're a very violent species. We are the only, I, if you may correct me here, but I think we're the only species that kills their, its own kind. And we have these big brains that have enabled us to slaughter them very effectively, and we do it. Uh, we, we're doing it uh, we, uh, as we speak. Um, and so th- we have to own this. It's no good sitting in a little sort of spiritual ghetto uh, singing, the Lord is my shepherd. We are also pe- a species, and we all feel at some stage they'd like to, we'd like to smash someone's teeth in. Uh, you know, I certainly f- get filled with rage sometimes. And we've got to acknowledge that within ourselves. Um, and so, uh, a- a- and see it for what it is. Uh, that, uh, and the, 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 the scriptures, because we are living always in violent times. So... It, it, it's, you can't, it's not a question of squaring it, it's a question of re- facing up to the, the, the realistic situation in which we are in. And I think the, f- the fact that you, we, we were chanting it almost impersonally means again that we were not thinking just about me, me, me. So, how, so how would you advocate reading that today, those kinds of passages? I would say, well, here, look, that's it. I... I have a lot of anger in me. And to, to say that, you know, it's only other people who, uh, or people of other religions or other faiths who commit violent acts, I can ima- I can't, I've had such a privileged life, uh, a life of extraordinary privilege and uh, uh, interest, and, uh, but I can imagine myself being very ugly indeed and rage vengeful if, if, if I had not, uh, if I were in living in, in poverty and in some of the distress and, and looking at the way the world is, is this vast discrepancy between rich and poor nations. Mm-hmm. And uh, so you take it because this is your human nature and don't just press, you know, uh, think that we're just all sweet souls. That, there is that violence in all of us. So how much of that informed your decision to be involved in uh, 10 years ago in unveiling the, the, the Charter for Compassion? Yeah, well, what I noted, I, I got this TED Prize. Uh, TED give, gave, used in those days to give prizes to people whom they thought had made a difference to the world, but who with their uh, help could make more of an impact. And they give you a wish, gave you a wish for a better world. And so I had been, was sick and tired of hearing religious leaders coming together uh, to uh, sort of uh, inveigh against homosexuality, for example. Or, uh, you nev- what you never heard them saying was talking about the golden rule, which is in every single scripture, never treat others as you would not like to be treated yourself. And that you had to apply to everybody, not just to the people you like, because that's what the world needs. Unless now we learn to ensure that all peoples, whether we like them or not, are treated as we would wish to be treated, the world is not going to be a viable place. And so I, uh, I asked Ted to help me create a charter for, which would bring the golden rule back to the fore. And so Ted put together a, 
uh, a, uh, a, a panel of, of re leading thinkers representing seven major world faiths, and we went to G wrote the charter together in Geneva. And then it became a kind of movement. It's a checkered movement. Uh, so, so Ted was very keen on uh, everybody signing up. It was a rather showbiz, and so there's always that side of it. I was never, you know, uh, and so people were writing down, I just helped an old lady across the road. Now, this is fine, and I shall shortly be in need of that kind of attention myself. <laughs> but <laughs> but uh, this is not what I had in mind. Uh, there, there, are, there are more serious, serious matters. Uh, it's going. We've just had our 10-year anniversary, and we've got a new personnel now. Uh, the success story, in my view, though, uh, which has got very little support in, 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 the, in the United States, where the, 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 the charter is based, mm -hmm. uh, is Pakistan. Interesting. Right uh, in this... In this De desperate country. Um, they are a bit, and business people are key here because business people know how to take a quixotic idea and translate it into something factual and practical. They know how to pilot something, find out what works, what doesn't. And a bus young businessman who's also a leading social activist in Pakistan, uh, he took the charter on. And he he said, we're making Karachi one of the compassionate cities. He sent out a questionnaire uh, to all Karachi citizens. What would you like compassionate Karachi to be like? They said, what would you like us to concentrate on? They said education. So he got together a team of educationalists who took my little book, four, 12 Steps to a Compassionate Life, and formed it into a training system uh, which, ha uh, and that, which had to be imbibed by every teacher and everybody working in the building. Um, and uh, they uh, now have, uh, uh, they, they are now run, the charter is now running all the government schools in Sindh, in the province of Sindh, and the neighboring province is taking it on. And these are mostly quite privileged uh, uh, schools. So every one of these schools has to team up with a school in the impoverished areas. So the rich kids get to see what's going on. And, uh, and so th th they've also applied that same to a hospital. I went last on my last visit, I went to the Aga Khan's Children's Hospital. And uh, the doctor, young doctor who ran, ran the thing said, uh, we go into medicine because we are compassionate, but it gets knocked out of us with our training. And there's, there's a rift between junior doctors and the surgeons and the, high, and, and, uh, the nurses are regarded with as contempt and the administrative staff are nowhere. They've gone through this training system and, the hos and the, they said the culture of the hospital has completely changed. And the children are going home two or three days earlier as a result. Okay. And now that's beginning to be taken, that, that system is being taken up by other, other hospitals. And it's that practical, um, uh, that sheerly practical thing is, is, is what is required. I'm not see I, a lot of it is a bit on the airy-fairy side in uh, the United States, I have to say. Though I think we may uh, be seeing the new uh, head of the charter uh, uh, next week when I, I'm in the States, so uh, maybe we can ginger it up a bit. But, but uh, so that, it, that is what we need to be doing, not just having uh, nice ideas about holding hands, and, 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 but we need to, uh, do, to make compassion something that is practical uh, and usable. And, 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 vi and basically viable. But you, I think you need a good practical business head to do that, and I think we should take m much more notice of business people here who are very eager to help. In fact, religious leaders, most th with one or two exceptions, were not the people who came forward to help me. It was mostly business people. Sadly, we're almost out of time. Yes. I have asked you two more questions. W one is, the literary theorist Northrop Frye was once asked, what happens if the myths we live by are forgotten or discarded? 
And his response was this, God will have to try his luck with another species. <laughs> <laughs> would, would you concur? Would, yes, would you concur? yes. I, I, I do think we're in a very, very dangerous place. I, I do think we harden our hearts against growing fury. And you see, in the old days, uh, the, uh, a small aristoc every civilization was founded by an aristocracy Night, comprised 10% of the population, and 90% uh, of peasants were suppressed. Uh, but the peasants never saw the, ins the enjoyed the riches of the, the town. In, in China, uh, the peasants lived in underground dwelling pits in the countryside. They never entered the cities. They never saw the beautiful things, the beautiful urns and inscriptions that, you, that were produced, uh, the, the wonderful riches of, of, of Chinese civilization. And that applied all the way through. But now, that with our divide, we flaunt our wealth uh, on, on the social media and advertising. They see this vast inequity and there's growing anger and hence the, the, this flow of migrants literally dying, uh, and, and rage and distress. Um, and this, I, I, I fear for this very much. I think we're at the beginning of, of, of some major, major crisis. And we still, and, and yet, our whole, we're retreating, as I said earlier, into Brexit-like ghettos to try and block out that pain. Uh, and it's, it's not sustainable. And the scriptures tell us, go out there, go out, extend your compassion right out to the rest of the world. Unless we do that and just confine ourselves to singing a few hymns in church once a week, uh, then uh, religion will, will be failing. The, the traditions that are in, our, in those scriptures uh, that, that were pointing out uh, that we had to see that the, the, the sacred core in every single human being, and the Upanishads that see uh, that, that, that everything of the planet, uh, including a banyan seed or a tree or a human being, has the same sacred core within it. Uh, we don't see that anymore. We just use the, 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 the nature as a, to some things to be exploited, and we don't see that other people who live in other, uh, other societies or even the poor in our own societies uh, have that same sacredness. And it's interesting to come back to Lion Man where you have that sense of reaching out to in inimical species and embracing it in the, in, in the, in the cave lion, that this, statu this little statuette was discovered two or three days before the outbreak of World War II when we discovered what happened when people lost that sense of the, of the sac absolute sac sacredness of every single human being. Given the responsibility you're infusing this idea of rescuing the scriptures, whose job should it be to rescue the scriptures? I think every one of us who reads them. It's no good waiting for some uh, council or pope or something to do it. Uh, we are the ones that read our scriptures and we should hear that mandate um, and, and be inventive about it, and be imaginative about it, as, as, as the, the, the exegetes used to be, to make it apply to our time, and in a practical way uh, that can change the world. Uh, that's what we, that we should be doing with the text, instead of having absurd schemes of, 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 of returning to the seventh century, for example. Karen Armstrong, thank you very, very much. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> 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 Just one.